maybe I'd do better off if I didn't read them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You might wonder why I would uh, start that off. We started the service with that opening. And uh, I got to, to thinking about this. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter season already. Uh, as I as I move along this road in life, a little further and a little further, these calendar weeks seem to start turning as if they're calendar days. I'm sure none of the rest of you have that, that problem. But I'm thinking this is the, the fourth Sunday of Easter already, and, and the phrase that we use all through this Easter season of Alleluia. And uh, so it, it got me thinking, and, and then it got me, well, maybe I'll make a remark or two before my lesson, which... Might or might not be a good thing. It's kind of like reading, but we still got two more Sundays labeled Sundays of Easter. We still got Easter five and Easter six, and then we get to the Sunday after the Ascension, and then we're to Pentecost already. This phrase "Alleluia" becomes then, in this ordinary season, the longest season of our church year, an option in the services. It's there if if it's. Uh, chosen to be used in the Eucharist, and those of you that have been with me these last two years as your deacon know when I dismiss you, I dismiss you with the hallelujahs on there. And your response, of course, is thanks be to God, hallelujah, hallelujah. It's a, to me, it's, it's just a, it's a, a wonderful thing. It's when I hear hallelujah, it's something that, that my soul just grabs on to this resurrection, this Easter message of this resurrection that enables me at the end of this life to pass on into eternal life with the Father. These are just some musings from your old deacon. I, I, I guess uh, <laughs> uh, I just uh, came to me and I said, well, if it came to me, there was probably a reason, so, so I would share it. But uh, we move on to today's uh, message. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, man. Well, Easter 4, which we just talked about, it begins a new segment of readings in our Easter Gospels. On the first Sunday of Easter, we learned about the empty tomb. On the second Sunday, how Jesus convinced Thomas that he had indeed risen. And last week, on Easter 3, Luke's account of Jesus' appearance to the assembled disciples. Now here we are. Easter 4 arrives, and it brings us a parable of the Good Shepherd. And I say here, it's unclear whether or not the Good Shepherd is a parable in the strictest sense. Uh, most commentators, I, I think, would allude to it as, as a uh, metaphor. doesn't matter any to me. It, it's a point of comparison which embodies an important message in Jesus' teachings. It's just a little bit different than the direct uh, uh, post-resurrection uh, lessons we've had the last couple of weeks. Today, perhaps you've noticed the theme of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, both in our music and in our liturgy that uh, Sherry read. We open and close our service, singing hymns to proclaim Him as our Shepherd, and during the service we sing to Him glorifying His holy name, which we just did. The 23rd Psalm was titled in our ESV Bible, The Lord is My Shepherd. Our Gospel reading today comes from the 10th chapter of John, and it is appropriately titled, I Am the Good Shepherd. And also our New Testament lessons were on the theme of the shepherd and the sheep. In the first lesson from Acts, after Peter and John had healed a lame man at the temple gates, they were called in front of the authorities. They were arrested. And they were ordered that next day then to explain how they performed this miracle. And Peter explained that it was made possible in the name of Jesus. Jesus whom they had crucified, but whom God had raised from the dead. In the second lesson, which we didn't read this morning, <laughs> which, but I, I've got to tell you, I, I told Andy, you had read from the, the third chapter of John, uh, not the first letter of John, but I told Andy there's a point in there uh, that you made that I think I try to make in here, and it may, it may be the Holy Spirit working to somebody who can grab on 
to that point when it comes. So in that way, it, I thank you for doing that. In the second lesson, though, which was from the first letter of John, it's, it's kind of hard now that we didn't read it together, but it, it's pretty self-explanatory where he was getting at. John calls attention to the knowledge possessed by Christ's followers. They know that they are the truth. We know that we are the truth, and they know that God lives because He lives in us in spirit. This corresponds to the Gospel section in which Jesus says He knows His sheep, and His sheep know Him. In the church here this Sunday, it has been known for many years as Good Shepherd Sunday. I couldn't remember if that usually if that was really listed in the, the uh, lectionary before as Good Shepherd Sunday or not. Uh, bounced it off Andy, he couldn't remember. I couldn't find it anywhere, so it's just the fourth Sunday of Easter. But for quite obvious reasons, it has been known for all these years in the church as the Good Shepherd Sunday when all these things come together. And as I was preparing for today's sermon, I did what, what most uh, people do when they get a subject to come up. I, I googled pictures of the Good Shepherd because I can remember from Sunday school seeing all these pictures and coloring them. Well, you can imagine how many million images of the Good Shepherd came up. And if I was all successful in giving some of them to Tina electronically, you may see some of them projected for us. I'm not going to turn around and look. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to trust that the, that the Holy Spirit's hand was upon that because we, we have sensitive systems when it comes to doing that. But you'll, you'll, get, the, you'll get the idea as, as she goes through a couple of them. And there's no question that we treasure uh, this image as Jesus is our good shepherd. He walks through the field with his staff in his hand and his sheep follow on him and, and they, they follow him because they know him. They know the sound of his voice. He calls them. He holds the lamb in his arms or some of the pictures on his shoulders. He shields it from all harm, from danger. Those are the images that are emblazoned on our hearts and in our minds. And they bring us comfort when we need it most. Because they aren't based on speculation or longing, but on the very Word of God. Remember our first reading, or our psalm reading this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I can't recall a funeral service that I've been to that that, that psalm wasn't, uh, wasn't read. Uh, he comforts us in our time of need, and we have His very Word in Scripture that, that this is so. But this morning, the emphasis is on the shepherd. Throughout the Bible, we've been likened to sheep. We err and we stray and we lose our way and it's, it's, we've got to be led back to the right path by our gracious and, and our redeeming Lord. I recall David Barton's comments from our American Heritage Series lesson last week in adult Christian ed. And by the way, if, if you haven't been taking advantage of, of this American Heritage series that we're in, I think we have five more yet, be here Sunday morning at 9 o'clock before the service for it. It's, uh, you, you'll learn and, and you'll, well, you'll be blessed for it. And, and uh, it's Christian education. The country, will be the country will be better off for it. Ab absolutely. So I encourage you to come. But in this last week, it, he says, I raise sheep. Anyone that thinks it's a compliment that we are called sheep in the Bible don't know a thing about sheep. They are the most ignorant animal that has ever existed. If I want them to go into this pen, they're going to go into that pen. <laughs> Because I actually have to use sheep psychology on them to try to get them to go in the wrong pen so they'll go in the right pen. Sound familiar? <laughs> they are rebellious. Everything is wrong about them. When the Bible says that Jesus is the good shepherd, the great shepherd, that is significant. Also in Margaret Feinberg's book, Scout in the Divine, My Search for God in Wing, Wool, and Wild Honey, she has a great section on the Good Shepherd and it recounts her personal experiences learning about sheep and the shepherds 
And I'd recommend it to you for reading. Uh, I know Andy has has a copy of it, so we could we could write down all the pertinent information you need to get it. I think it, I'd recommend it. But now let's get back to our focus on the shepherd. Our gospel lesson begins this morning. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is one of Jesus' I am statements in John's Gospel. John has picked up the name I am and placed it throughout his Gospel. Jesus is the great I am of the Old Testament. God in human form. In John 8.12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. And in John 8, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. The point here is that I am is the holy name of God. And John wants us to make no mistake about it. Jesus is the Word made flesh, God Almighty in human form. The reading continues, He who is a hired hand and not a sheep, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus wasn't talking to his followers. He was addressing the Pharisees. They were accusing him of sin because he had healed a blind man on the Sabbath in the chapter before this, in chapter 9. His response is that he's the good shepherd, not like the hired hands who abandoned the sheep because they didn't really care for him. They would have known that Jesus was drawn an allusion here to Ezekiel 34, where the prophet gives them the warning. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherd feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the face of the earth, with none to search or seek for them. Those statements resound in my mind and I think probably most of us in other places in the New Testament where, where Jesus is teaching. You didn't feed my, my sheep. You didn't take care of my sick. He is stating this right to the Pharisees and the Pharisees know exactly where this is coming from. And throughout their salvation history, the Jewish people used the Good Shepherd image for God. It was used by Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Zechariah, and by David in his Psalms. Psalm 80 begins, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who would lead Joseph like a flock. And of course today's psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. And the Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus meant. He was claiming to be God. And they also knew that he was contrasting himself to them, the hired hands that were trusted to care for God's people, but cared only for themselves. Again, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. In contrast to the hirelings, Jesus is the good shepherd, and he knows his sheep. God's people are Jesus' very own sheep. They belong to him, 
He knows us personally. He compares his knowledge of his sheep to his father's knowledge of him and his knowledge of the father. That's how intimate Jesus' knowledge of the sheep is. He knows everything about us. He came and entered into the very nature and life of his people, into our sin, although he was without sin, in our sorrows, into our weakness and pain, and into our needs and wants. The relationship is the good shepherd that the good shepherd has with his flock is a mirror of the relationship that Jesus has with his own father. The relationship between God the Father and his son is the model for Jesus' fellowship with his own, us. We are the sheep to the good shepherd, but the good shepherd is the sheep to his father God. Remember John the Baptist when he, when he saw Jesus coming. Behold, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. A shepherd who loves his flock, his flock enough to die for them, and a flock which has spent so much time with the shepherd that they know him, and they trust him, and they obey him. They do exactly what he says. He is that good, and that loving, and that sacrificial. Today's lesson concludes, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, and I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. In the commentary on John by Rodney Whitaker, in part it speaks to those verses, and, and, he, and he says the following, The most natural reading accepted by most commentators is that Jesus is referring to sheep outside the fold of Judaism. There are Gentiles who will listen to his voice and be joined to his flock. He does not clearly specify on what terms the Gentiles are to be included, and so the church later had to discern his will whether or not the Gentiles must be converts to Judaism in order to join his flock. If you remember the Council of Jerusalem, I believe it was in 50 A.D. That's what he's talking about here. But in the present context, the context of the reading today, which describes a follower who had been expelled from the synagogue, the blind man from birth, from chapter 9, hints at the answer. And to me, what this hint is, was fairly simple. Jesus revealed himself, and the man believed, and became one of his flock. Jesus became his shepherd. Jesus concludes the teaching by revealing more, fu more fully the mystery involved in his laying his life down for the sheep. He says he lays his life down of my own accord, which makes it clear that his life is not taken from him by his opponents. At no point in the gospel are his actions determined by human agenda, and his death will be no different. Pilate may think he has authority, but Jesus tells him, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Jesus' statement that he has authority to lay down his life stretches the imagery, imagery <laughs> of a shepherd. He's speaking to these people. and He, he, he says he's, he can lay down his life. And so this stretches even further the, what the shepherd does because these shepherds, the leaders in those days, that wasn't part of their agenda. They were in it for what they could get for it, and, and the people came second. Jesus turns this all around, this, this mystery that he, that, he, that he shows them. But in his next sense, he, he proceeds to transcend it altogether by saying he has authority not only to lay it down, but to take it back.
Resurrection, the, the idea of resurrection wasn't, wasn't new. It was, it was something that they came. Some, some uh, uh, bought into the resurrection, some didn't. I believe the Pharisees did. Sadducees have no part of it. But it wasn't an unknown word. But in this context, as a man claiming to be God speaking to them, the Messiah teaching was there. And, and they were just, uh, who would know if they were oblivious to it, they were blinded to it uh, by their own devices and desires, just as we're blinded to a lot of things by ours. It's a, it's a tough thought, but it's one that we have to take to heart. Anyhow, that teaching, this, this teaching on this resurrection, becomes clear in John's next chapter, in chapter 11, and that's where he speaks of resurrection. Of course, that's not the lesson for today, and I don't want to be up here for two hours, and I, you don't want me to either. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just read, read uh, one verse from his chapter 11. That I, it sums it up for me. He tells us in 11.25, I am, another I am, the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And he concludes all of this, this lesson by grounding everything that he has said in truth. In laying down his life and in taking it back, he is obeying his Father. He knows his Father's voice and he obeys just as we are to hear His voice and obey. There's unspeakable joy in having and knowing this Good Shepherd. Under the shepherding of Jesus, we are saved from every wolf and bear and lion, spiritually. We're saved from sin and death. In this Shepherd, there's pardon and peace and safety and security. The pictures that we had. In Jesus we are saved into life everlasting. He triumphed over death and rose again in glory. He took our sins to the cross and He saved us from the fire of hell that we are powerless to do for ourselves. In this Easter season, we proclaim this triumph and this resurrection. I want to conclude today by reading some verses from the, later on in this 10th chapter of John, 27 through 30. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. We and Jesus are one. So believe on Jesus, and confess His holy name, and accept this grace that has been given to us through His Son's work on the cross by a gracious and loving and forgiving Father our Father, God Almighty. Amen. Amen. You please stand. Let us profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came.